All righty, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to How to Dual Stack Without Losing Your Mind. I know everybody's sitting here going, there's letters in my IP address. I don't like it. it it's okay. Everybody will be okay. All right. So my name is Dennis Burgess. Uh, I work with Link Technologies. We are a consulting shop. We do uh, Microtech, Ubiquity, Cambium, Mimosa, uh, Netonix, pretty much every major brand out there. Uh, we sell towers. We have tower enclosures. We have power links. We have plenty of products. Please stop by our booth uh, whenever you go back in. Uh, I believe we're probably going to run a little over. And uh, I know the exhibit hall is open, so I don't think that'll be a, a big issue. However, we will tell you if uh, we do go over, and uh, that way if you guys need to run and hit the exhibit hall. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about what IPv6 is. And this is the short, short, short version. We're not going to go into packet headers. Nobody cares about those mostly um, we're not going to go into you know all kinds of different things we're not going to talk about you know nat 64 or 6 to 4 or anything like that we're just going to talk about how i prefer to dual stack now is the method that i use the most common method eh, maybe maybe not can't sit there and tell you that is it per who uh, so like aaron they actually publish their own uh, standard and uh, is it per aaron standard the answer is no it's not um that's the way I do it. Is it right or wrong? The answer is it's up to you to decide. You can uh, sit there and do that. Then if you look at uh, another one of the uh, registrars, I can't think of which one, they actually have published their own V6 and it's different than Aaron's. So again, there's not really a right or wrong in how you dual stack as far as the uh, subnet options, uh, but uh, we are going to talk about uh, IPv6, how does it route? We're going to talk about subnetting because I think that's uh, fairly important. And then how I dual stack. So let's uh, kind of get into this. So uh, obviously we have 128 bit addresses. They definitely look different than what everybody is used to. However, their functionality remains the same. So we have uh, 128 bits, we have letters and numbers. So we go, it's a hexadecimal, I can't pronounce today hexadecimal thank you uh it is a hexadecimal number uh basically each field represents uh 65,536 i believe uh ip uh addresses okay the colon will replace dots i believe we call these hex tits or hex hex it's hex it's no quartets are the uh the v4 ones nope those are octets octets uh, we'll get it right. At any which rate, uh, you can, uh, if you have any fields that have zeros, you can, of course, just write a single zero. And then if you have multiple zeros, then you can write a double colon. But you can only use one double colon inside an IPv6 address. All right? Uh, very, very basic stuff here. Uh, as far as network address translation, 99.9% .9 of systems do not do IPv6 NAT. There is no such thing in the standard. However, there is, quote, IPv6 NAT that several vendors have developed. Uh, I won't go into that because that's really not something that we really want to do. We want to give every customer IPv6 addresses, public IPv6 addresses. That is the goal with having 128-bit uh, addresses that we have so many IPs that... Uh, one, it makes it very hard to scan, but number two, we have so many IPs that we can give every customer a, a godly amount of IPs and they can use it for whatever they want. So that is one of the goals with that. As far as routing with uh, Microtech anyway, it functions the same. You have a destination address and then you have a gateway. That's it. It's just like any other uh, routing protocol such as IPv4 anyway. Um, as far as IPv4 and IPv6, there is no protocol interaction. So you don't sit there and say, well, this protocol, you know, we, we don't translate these or anything like that. You can take a 6 IP and translate it to a v4. It's called NAT 6 to 4 or 6 4. But I would highly recommend that kind of defeats the purpose of dual stacking. So I would highly recommend not to do those types of things. Um, furthermore, uh, for the users, how many people in here use Microtech? 
everybody okay got it um the microtech does not have the incomplete ipv6 stack there is plenty of protocols and things like that that's built into uh, other devices that microtech does not have such as nat 6 to 4 uh nat 4 to 6 etc which is perfectly fine as long as you're going to dual stack okay um why do you run dual stack is because guess what if you do not have a ipv6 layer and then a ipv4 layer then you're not running dual stack that's all that dual stack uh, stands for is that i have both ipv6 and ipv4 on my routers the other thing that dual stack is very important or very uh, important is ipv4 pricing is going up uh, I actually pulled some data from uh, IPv4 auctions. They actually publish all of their sale prices. And this was the trend that they had in the past uh, four years. So IPv4 is, will eventually become eh, possibly priced out for many people in this room. Uh, the last IPv4 block I think we bought, it cost us about $5,000. That was a good block, you know, worked out fine for us. However, I believe that they're selling for 8,000 now. And again, they're not making any more IPv4. So eventually, once the secondary market, once all these people sell all the IPs, et cetera, eventually there's not gonna be any more to get. There is also a huge list with Aaron for people who have been approved for IPv4 addresses that they don't have any IPv4 to give. So last time I checked, it was like 200 uh, uh, ASs on there that requested IPv4, and they may have gotten uh, you know a slash 16 or a slash 18 or 19 approved for that. But now they have to get that. So one of the things, if you are going to look for IPv4 addresses, this is just one of those things. You need to go to Aaron first and actually get approved for that block before Aaron will approve the transfer. So the example being, if you go out and say, hey, I want to buy a slash 22, and you did not have Aaron's approval, even though you bid on it, Aaron will not transfer that to you until they go through their normal approval process. So it is important that you do that prior to uh, trying to buy, because that will take a little bit, because you will have to justify it, all that kind of good stuff. So again, uh, IPv4 addresses are going up in uh, pricing. All right. So what, some of the myths. Why do we not? Uh, one of those myths is we don't need IPv6. Well, IPv4 is depleting rapidly. We kind of already uh, mentioned that. Uh, Aaron has a large list of uh, IPv4 approved companies, but no space to give them. Uh, current cost, about 18 to 20 bu bucks per IP. Cost is definitely going up. So uh, I don't see why we are not pushing v6 or why we especially as small operators we actually have something that something that these large carriers don't have which which is agility we can quickly and easily deploy ipv6 uh, i did a network that had about eh, 67 pop sites uh, we did some prep work basically rebooting routers to install ipv6 uh, the the package on the routers and the next day during business hours uh, they are all ppoe uh, we successfully deployed, I, it was like the, was this stupid number, I can't even sit there and tell you what it was, but we deployed IPv6 in one day on 64 sites. It's not difficult to do that, okay? Uh, we did bump all their users, and a lot of them got v6 addresses. So if they're using them, they, uh, or if they have IPv6, then they will start using it. So ever since uh, Windows... Not 98. What's the one after 98? Yeah, well, it was Windows 2000. Yeah, I think ME also. Windows 98 kind of supported V6, but then once we got to uh, Windows 7 and all that, by default, Windows 7 uses V6 as its preferred protocol, if at all possible. Now, you, there is some interop between V6 and V4. So uh, let's say I have a IPv4 DNS server. That DNS server is capable of giving an IPv6 answer back. And then you would use that address to go and get a fetch plan, uh, a web page. So there is some of that uh, uh, done, but that's about it. This actually happened about uh, two weeks ago uh, where the uh, country deployment for the United States actually reached 50% 
uh, of deployed IPv6. So there's a lot of companies out there that are deploying v6. I believe uh, Charter, which is a you know cable company, they have deployed v6 in select areas, Verizon Fios in very select areas. Um, there are mobile providers that they only give v6 addresses to their handsets. Now, one of the big reasons for that is that they actually know their handsets are all V6 capable, so they don't need any V4. But they literally give every uh, handset a V6 address because it just works. And it works well, and they have plenty of them. So as far as a switch over, is there going to be this immediate switch over uh, from V4 to V6? The answer is no. That, that time has definitely sailed uh basically we're probably going to have dual stack routers for i would probably say at least 10 to 20 years that's my estimate what did the experts say they said probably a really 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 long time but we don't know it's going to take a new operator like a new website that comes up and they can't get any v, uh, v4 ips so they're only on v6 once we get the next new thing like that, then that will drive IPv6 because then your customers are going to be calling saying, hey, I can't get to this website. Why can't I get to it? So very, very important uh, on that. But n almost all the major content providers, so Netflix, Google, uh, YouTube, Facebook, etc., are all V6 enabled already. Uh, I, I should say, you know, our website is all V6. It's not that difficult to get it. It just, you need to get it done. Um, another myth is, well, I have NAT on my customer routers, and now you're wanting me to put IPv6 Publix on my customer's fridge. Yes, yes, that's what we wish you to do. That is the way IPv6 is designed. Um, they go, but we have NAT now. NAT is, NAT is security. Well, NAT is not security. And if you go to any security conference, anything like that, NAT is mostly a false sense of security. Even though it does protect some of your subs and some of your inside devices, 99% of your NAT is not security because all you have to do is break into that router and then now you have access to everything. So, uh, the big thing with securing your IPv6 is your stateful firewalls. Um, we actually deploy a slash 48 or a larger block that we give to our customers by default. Okay, That block by default blocks inbound new connections from all of our external interfaces. Now we do that because we feel that most customers don't know what security is. They don't know that they're even getting a V6 address that the public or the world can access. So we block that. Now, obviously, if they request, hey, I, I need actual V6 access that actually has inbound uh, connections that are new, I, I need those opened up, not a problem. We can do that. It, it, we just give them, assign them another IP or another uh, uh, block. So with that and again if you have any questions please come on up here to the mic uh this session is being recorded so we definitely want you to ask those questions um so now the questions is how do i dual stack i am i'm a pretty simple guy i kind of stick to what i know works um there are no real hard requirements inside this uh networks these are networks that i take care of or i have deployed on so uh we will go from here so i use OSPF v3 for my IGP. It's very simple. I typically uh, copy all of the uh, interfaces from my OSPF. So we have all my costs for my interfaces. I literally just mirror them over to OSPF v3. Uh, we also have a router ID and that router ID can be the v4 loopback if that's what you wish it to be. It does not have to be a v6 address. Uh, it's just an ID. So uh, you can do that as well. Next, we are going to talk about these local link addresses. So as soon as I add those OSPF interfaces on there, all of a sudden we're going to have all these local link addresses, FE80s. Okay? They're just going to be magically populated. And what happens is, is all of a sudden these routers, anything that has an OSPF link, will start talking on the uh, local link address. And OSPF will use those to talk, and there's nothing else to configure. Literally, you turn it on the interfaces that you wish to deploy OSPF on, and it works. Okay? 
Now, you, there, there is a little more. You do have to make sure your network type is correct, but that's a, a standardized thing, I would think, anyway. Um, you can also use your loopback. You can put a uh, slash 128 loopback on your loopback interface if that is what you wish. Um, I typically lately have not been doing that. I just simply use my V4 loopback for uh, my loopback. Now, here's where uh, I kind of differ than, uh, from Aaron's. I typically assign a slash 48 to an area or a slash 48 to a tower, or I can actually assign a slash 52. So a slash 48 gives me 65,532 uh, slash 64s. And in all reality, the slash 64 is what you want to get to your customer. You want to give at least a slash 64, if not several. Now here's why. One of the reasons is you have stateless auto configure. So all of a sudden you got an IPv6 public IP on your router and you say advertise that. Now any device that's on that network immediately picks up that IP and auto configures for their MAC address and their IP address. And now they have V6. Simple as that. There's no DHCP server to create on the CPE. It just works. Aaron says we should assign a slash 48 per customer. That is a lot of IPs. And I'll talk about how many IPs that is. I don't feel that that is necessary. I understand Aaron's, uh, you know, their, be, their best practices. I don't agree with it. That's me. Okay. So you guys will have to make that up. Uh, I typically will use a slash 48 or a slash 52 and what we call nibble boundaries. So these are basically where when we look at an IP address, we have a field inside our uh, uh, IPs that this number can change and it will change my network number. So I'm not sitting there stating that 012 is one network and 234 is another network. I just want one number to change and all of a sudden my network changes. So you have slash 52s, slash 56s, slash 60s. Um, I've actually deployed a lot of networks with uh, slash 60s to customers. And the reason for that is because it gives them 16 uh, slash 64s. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the examples here, here's uh, a slash 48 uh, that you have 65,536 slash 64s. And if you uh, wish to assign each one, you just change that one number, and that's how uh, you do that. It's just like any other IPv4. The difference is you go from 0 to F instead of just 0 to 9. So uh, slash 52s, again, you can just simply change one IP, and then you get each individual slash 52. Same thing with 56s. You can see how the IPs move down. I will pause for him to take a picture. Good job. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, so that, that's basically it. Uh, I wish to assign, or I try to assign a slash uh, 60 to every sub. The reason why I do that, so again, I go here. Uh, I do this because it's simpler to, for a human to read. I don't want to have to sit there and break out my subnet calculator, like a, you know, a slash 29 or slash 28. Those would not be on nibble boundaries if there was a such thing as that in V4, but... That is why we would do that. Um, as far as what I recommend to give customers, I typically give a slash 60, 16 slash 64s. Why do I do this? I want to give the customer the option to use stateless auto configure. The reason why I sit there and state that I give them 16 slash 64s is many customers may have a guest network or they may have another network that needs its own IPv6 addressing. And that's why I'm giving them 16 slash 64s so they can literally make 16 different networks if they need to. Now, these are residential customers. It's no, and, and if I had a business that sat there and said, hey, I need a slash 48, I'd go, yeah, here you go. I'll assign one and I'll write one to you. It's not a big deal. Okay, we have plenty of IPs, but I don't feel it's necessary to give a home user a slash 48. I just don't think that that's a, a good idea. But... If you give a single customer a single slash 64, you just gave that customer 18 quintillion IPs in one slash 64. So it is a huge, huge number. Um, 
Again, I have done networks that we have given customers. So we do a prefix delegation and we say, here is your prefix and your prefix is a slash 64. That works unless they have maybe another router behind our router, then IPv6 don't work. Or it works uh, in any other, if they have a guest network, then it wouldn't be v6 enabled. So those are your options. It's not very difficult to hand out a slash 60 versus a 64. You can do a 63. That gives you two slash 64s. It's totally up to you. All right. Uh, let's see here. What else do I have? Again, this is just the same thing I just said that, you know, you can give them a slash 60. And a slash 60 would be written like those. And then you get... Uh, 16 slash 64s on each one. Hi, <clears throat> Owen DeLong, Sale Internet, also the Aaron Advisory Council. I'm gonna argue the other side of this. Um, 48s are good. There is no reason and no advantage whatsoever to giving an insight less than a 48. Um, <clears throat> it's completely V4 think to do so. Um, and it's actually harmful. Today, it's seemingly harmless because everybody has built their network to live within the constraints imposed by the shortage of addresses in v4 and the lack of strategies like DHCP prefix delegation, which I realize you're not covering yet, but um, in the world that is coming, unless you want to go back and do the work to renumber all of these things that you've handed out in small chunks, you're doing your customers a serious disservice in limiting their future flexibility because we are coming to a world where routers in the home will be uh, built into things like refrigerators and um, entertainment centers and other such things. And they're going to be asking for a prefix delegation from the router that talks to your ISP. And so if you delegate a 48 down to that router, then it can delegate 52s, 56s, 60s, 64s, whatever, to those subordinate routers automatically. Uh, if you delegate a 60, it's very, very hard for it to do that in any sort of a meaningful way. So while this works today, it really, really closes off the future that is coming. It really ignores technology that is already in the pipeline, and it is very harmful, um, in my opinion. There you go. So, again, everybody has his own opinion. I, I definitely respect that. I do not agree with that, but, hey, again, it's totally up to you. You guys have to make your own decisions. I'm just trying to get you the information on how to do that. So, as I just said, you know, customers can need more than one network. I mean, you may have a guest network in there. They may have their router. So, we actually had an ISP uh, that he's actually, I think, in this room uh, that we talked about how many IP addresses do we assign. And I think we decided on something like a slash 63 or something uh, small because we just wanted to hand them two, uh, two or three. I didn't do it. <laughs> That's a bad thing whenever I you know, hear a big loud noise and I, that's the first thing I say. Uh, again, you can do that. Uh, but one of the other issues with that is uh, we are talking about DHCP prefix delegation. So what we would do is we would do DA, uh, I'm sorry, PPOE to the customer, CPE. That, CP, that will get its own prefix delegation from the PPOE server. Now we have a slash 60 on our CPE. And then the CPE would have its own uh, IP, uh, DHCP PD or prefix delegation server to hand out any other prefixes that they needed. Most of the time, our customers, we actually install uh, a home router with them and it's running in bridge mode. So there's typically no need for, uh, or no need that I know of for a DHCP PD on the inside. However, again, if it did happen, it would be there and it would issue uh, another prefix out. Uh, again, if they had their router, let's say the customer uh, had their router behind it, and that router needed a prefix, then it would get one. So the home router running in bridge mode? Most of our home routers are in bridge mode, yes. But our CPE is running the PPOE, and it's in router mode. The, the, reason, the reason why we do that is because too many people unplug things 
And if you bridge your CPE, then that gives them layer two access to your wireless infrastructure or your wireless network. And we don't want anything to be transmitted on the wireless portion without going through a router. So that, that is our choice. It is not necessarily everybody's choice, but that is one of our choices. So, uh, all righty. So authentication, let's kind of talk about that. Uh, I prefer PPOE. Uh, I just did a session on uh, authentication options, but I pre uh, and I prefer PPOE, but here we go on this. Um, you use a username password using PPOE. Very simple, very basic authentication. Uh, creates a tunnel. That tunnel is what you're queuing on. Uh, everything comes through Radius. Radius has everything for IPv6 and V4 already in it. So there's nothing to reinvent. Uh, we get a lot of uh, companies that uh, they have their own homebrew uh, authentication system or they log into customer or I'm sorry, their routers and push data out. I don't really like that. I like a simple uh, solution that has already been vetted and has been used for years and years and years and years. So um, MTU, I know we get some people that say that PPOE has MTU issues. Uh, again, it, it, it's only an issue if you're doing it wrong. Uh, you need to probably fix your MTU issues and then you won't have a problem. Uh, most systems, most home routers, uh, again, if you do use your home routers, as well as Cambium, uh, Microtech, Ubiquity, they all support PPOE. So there's not a reason not to uh, use that if necessary. Uh, you can use DHCP uh, v6. This is what we call prefix delegation. So if you have, uh, let's say you assign a slash 48 to a tower and then a customer requests uh, another IP block, you can hand out anything from a slash, anything below a flash 48, if that's what you have available. Uh, so you can sit there and hand out slash 60s, you can hand out slash 64s. Uh, we actually did a uh, MDU complex with IPv6. Uh, we did a slash 48 per building uh, because that gave us plenty of IPs. And then we actually had a, uh, the very first block was a slash 64 on the customer facing interface and the reason for that was is that we actually had lots of cell phones and laptops that just connected to the wi-fi in the hotel or i'm sorry into the uh, mdu and therefore they would simply get a stateless auto configuration address for their v6 but then we also had people because these were uh, uh it was a home uh it was an apartments they also had people that would plug in their own home router in and we needed to be able to issue uh, DHCP prefixes to those subs as well. Uh, it was kind of a nightmare with queuing because we wanted to limit everybody to 20 meg, but then we're like, how do we do that? We had to limit each slash 128 to 20 meg on the first prefix that we used, but then any delegations, we had to limit each slash 64 to 20 meg. So that each individual, uh, each individual unit would only get 20 meg instead of getting however many IP v6 addresses they had times 20 meg. Try that again. I didn't. I didn't hear that. Yep. That that's what they wish to do. You know. Again, it was just one of those uh, things that that's what they wanted and they wanted to also give prefixes to any home router that they plugged in uh keep in mind this is like they, they don't they just wanted to limit the speed for the sake of limiting so that they didn't you know have people eating up bandwidth left and right even though technically they could just by connecting to and actually many people do many people just they'll have wi-fi built into their computers and they'll just connect you know four computers to the Wi-Fi that the hotel provide or the the building provides. So uh, there are no more MAC addresses. Uh, we do have a DUID, uh, which is kind of like a MAC address, but the DUID that we get, especially in Ubiquity gear, uh, you can only get it through the key, the command line. There's nothing in the GUI that you can actually get. So. Our issue currently is that our industry, at least Ubiquity, has not decided that they want to 
really help end users and get the DUID as it should be. So um, you can sit there and delegate which prefix each person is going to get by getting their DUID, but currently that is only done in command line in Ubiquity Gear. Uh, how do I authenticate? Uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, if you have an interface, so like if you have a customer that has a 100 meg port, that's very, very easy to do. You can do, uh, what, what's the protocol that they use on switches? Uh, 802.1x, I believe it is. There's plenty of different ways. If they're getting 100 meg, honestly, I would sit there and put that same port into the, the switch, uh, into the VLAN that we actually give out PPOE and just assign them a PPOE username and password. Um, Again, your billing system must support V6. Uh, we have had several billing systems say, oh yeah, we support V6, but then when you really get down to it, they don't really have a way to figure out what the DUID is that the customer needed to get an IP on. Uh, again, some, uh, some customers or some of these uh, billing systems, they will use radius which is a really good method but then they have to support and they have to have the fields like one particular company they have uh, ipv6 prefixes that you can assign uh, but they do not have the uh, framed route yet for ipv6 so you cannot route a block to a customer yet why they didn't put that in there in their uh, radius server i have no idea but uh, i'm sure they will pretty shortly Correct. Even though it's built in, even though Radius ha uh, has that, they don't have it in their Radius server, which is odd, I understand. More than likely, they probably have it. They probably haven't built it on their GUI. What was the question? Yes. So the question was, does Microtech uh, support framed IP route, uh, IPv6 route uh, is, yes. Mm, no, no. I mean, it's been out for a couple of years at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, keep in mind, Microtech, you know, they, they try to stick to standards, they say, uh, but they don't have the entire IPv6 stack in there. So, you know, that's a whole other issue in itself. All right. Um, as far as management, we actually had a good question that kind of got brought up in a IPv6 debate uh, on uh, Facebook. And it was how, you know, wh why am I going to do anything with v4 anymore? Why don't I just deploy native v6, you know, no v4 uh, and just do that? The, the issue with that is, is there's always going to be websites, at least in the near future, that will be only v4 accessible. And unless you get a NAT64 translation box, something that can actually translate your V6 address to your V4 addresses, um, it's not really a good ideal. The other issue, and this is kind of a, a, a bigger one, is that you know when we get our thermostat that's Wi-Fi connected, does it actually have a V6 in it? If it doesn't, and you're only assigning your customers to V6 prefixes it may work for every device but that one and that's when you're going to get a call so again what we would do is simply just do dual stack and it doesn't matter if you're dual stacking with private v4s and then adding them out you still give them uh, v4 access uh, and then as far as management goes the question comes do you want to actually manage all of your devices with v6 and how do you remember all those ip addresses um, what we typically do is we have a private DNS server that we operate um, that is actually part of our Windows domain, but that particular, DN that particular uh, DNS server, we actually enter private information in and IP addresses under D underneath DNS names. So one of the big things is you're going to use a lot more DNS names for management because you're never going to remember these IP addresses. I mean, I, I don't remember half the IP addresses that I get told either, um, but a lot of people are going to start using DNS for, to, for management. It's either that or you're going to have a lot of spreadsheets. So, uh, again, I kind of just covered why uh, or when we use IPv6 uh, for management. Um, 
DNS is definitely your friend there. We, we do a lot of that uh, privately as well. As far as security goes, again, we kind of go back to the, the thing. I'm giving you know all these IPv6 addresses out, all of them perfectly public, and then we're you know literally putting an IPv6 address on the refrigerator that you know uh, the customer has. How secure is that? Um, nothing beats a standard stateful firewall. You need to be protected, and you need to help protect your customers in that. I. It is very simple to reassign their prefix outside of the IPs that are protected so that they can do their own thing if that's something that they wanted to do. Um, again, you do need to have that IPv6 firewall. Uh, I'm not going to sit there and say that you need to go nuts with it. Uh, we are in the business of pushing data, but especially in the near term, most customers are dumb. Simple as that and we cannot rely on the router vendors to install a decent firewall for them because most people they just plug in the router and leave the default username password on it and stuff like that anyway so it is very important that we actually sit there and start talking to our customers about hey you're going to have to be proactive and, uh, and secure those devices so again full stateful uh, firewall nat is not security um I did do a little research because I was just curious about how fast can we scan IPv6. And there is a number of technologies and uh, uh, not necessarily technologies, but tricks that you can do that can definitely increase the, speeding, uh, increase the speed of scanning IPv6. Um, the fastest one I found could do like 61,000 IPv4s a minute. Uh, it basically took about an hour to scan the entire IPv4. That's how many IPv4 there are. There's not that many. Uh, but whenever we look at that and we look at scanning an individual slash 64 at that same speed, uh, it came up to some interesting results as I just see, as I am uh, just showing you there. So uh, like 5,000 or 569,000 years just to scan one slash 64. So even though we say that because of the IPs, the number of IPs that we're giving out, uh, that is going to help with port scanners. There are definitely some technologies. So it is much harder, or it makes scanning the IPv6 internet much harder, but you still need to have that standard stateful firewall inside your router uh, or inside the customer router. Uh, again, we usually put that, that firewall on the customer CPE. Keep in mind, we use Microtech for our customer CPE, so we have all those capabilities. Um, if they want us to remove it, it's simple enough to remove the, uh, uh, the inbound block. So with that said, uh, I have completed my slides and we'll get it over to, uh, uh, Mark here. Any questions? I, I see a lot of deer in the headlights. Look, everybody's ready to go drinking. <laughs> Gotcha. So the question is, how did I prepare to dis deploy 64 pops in a day? Um, the big thing was making sure all of our, in this case, making sure all of our router OS versions were up to date, uh, or at least the same. Uh, and mostly it was rebooting of the routers to install the IPv6 package. So some of them had it on, some of it didn't have it on. So basically I just had to review each one of those routers in uh, select enable and then it took us about three weeks of various times to reboot routers uh, to get everything ready once it was ready it's pretty much uh, you know go uh, go on the router configure ospf v3 uh, assign the ip prefixes that you need to on that router uh, change your authentication options so that now you have uh, uh, the PD, uh, the prefix delegation in your PPOE system, and that's about it. I mean, then kick, kick all the users off and they'll come back and if they've requested a V6 address, they'll get one, or they will get a prefix, I should rephrase that, so. Do you know a percentage of customers have called in after the conversion with uh, incompatibility problems, IPv4 To my knowledge on that particular network, uh, so the question is, is there any, do I have any numbers of people that have called after deploying V6 that have some type of problem? Would that be correct? Okay. Um, the answer, I did not know of any. 
I, I don't have any problems with V6 to my knowledge. Uh, I don't know what kind of problems they might have other than typically your, your DNS servers need to be checked to make sure they can actually give V6 addresses, but that should have been done, you know, several years back. I mean, V6 is not new. I mean, it's been out for what, 15, 20 years? I mean, it, it's been out for a long time. And Windows, like Windows, by default, it wants to use V6. So, you know, it just, once, once you deploy it, it gets your abs and IP, and magically you're on the V6 internet. Do you also prefer V6 routing? I'm sorry? Do you also prefer V6? Yeah, it, it won't use it. Yep. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, question back there. Uh, when you go to dual stack, what's the ratio of traffic between V6 and V4? That's really a good one. It, it, the question is, is what do, uh, or what is the ratio of traffic between V6 and V4? Um, usually it doesn't go up immediately because you also, it, it depends if you kick all the users off or if you just allow them to come back on and grab a prefix. If you kick them off, then they may grab a prefix or not. Usually we get, I would say, 20 to 25% of users requesting the V6 prefix. Um, and then most, a lot, most of their traffic, depending on what they're going to, again, it really depends. Um, I really don't have those numbers. So I can't really sit there and tell you that. I do know, uh, I actually downloaded a little utility for Chrome. Uh, it's uh, uh, IPv foo. That's what it's called. And it just adds a little six or a four up in the uh, toolbar to tell you if you're V6 connected to that website or V4 connected. And most of the websites I go to are V6 enabled. And, you know, other than they, there may be some other V4 IPs in there, but they have V6 uh they, you know, they're, they're running V6. It's only whenever I'm Googling something odd that, that I go to V4. So, any other questions? I'm not sure if Is there any MTU considerations for IPv6? None that I know of. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, your standard MTU, your 1500 is fine. So... Anything else? Awesome. Oh, one more question here. So the question is, is in terms of firewalling, how much more complicated is it to firewall IPv6? It's not more complicated. It's a bigger number. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, but I mean, as far as the firewall rules, they should be basically identical for the most part, other than the, the addresses, you know, and such. So, and keep in mind, you do have uh, some protocol differences like uh, ICMP v3 or v6, whatever it is, versus that. But, you know, those are, are minor things. So, all right, we're going to go on over here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark. Um, I have some answers to those questions as well. Uh, so on our network for device, uh, for customer homes that we've deployed IPv6 dual stack on, we see about 20 to 30% of the traffic moves over to v6. Um, we haven't really dug deep into what traffic is going to v6 versus v4, or what devices are preferring 6 or 4, but that's kind of what we see on the gateways. Um, on MTU, there is maybe a slight MTU concern that you would want to think about. Um, if you have your MTU set, say, by default to 1500, you should be aware that if that's a layer 2 MTU, uh, that IPv6 will take a little bit more space because the IPv6 headers are bigger, so the payload will be decreased in size if that ends up being a problem. Usually these days it's not a big problem because there's path MTU discovery and most protocols have figured it out. And also a lot of apps are safe and use like 1400-ish MTUs max. Um, but that is something that you should be aware of. And actually I'll cover that and we have run into a case where that becomes a problem with uh, V6 tunneling. And uh, 
Let's see, the last question was around firewalls. Um, we found that v6 firewalls are actually significantly easier to manage because you have a lot less rules. There won't be any NAT, SNAT, Masquerade, any of those rules, they're all gone. So really, um, it's a much more straightforward uh, process of thinking about what you want to come in, what you want to forward, what you want to you know, let come out and establish connections. So it's actually, in my opinion, a lot more logical than sometimes some of the v4 stateful, stateful firewall rules where you're thinking about like, you know, a lot more flows and you're thinking about a lot more uh, kind of like NAT translation possibilities, especially if you have other features involved like DMZ and specific port type of stuff, if that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, let's see if I can get this going. All right, that was pretty easy. Okay, everybody, I'm from Common Networks. Uh, we're a new-ish uh, ISP. We also build a lot of technology. Um, we're founded in 2016. Uh, some of the major differences between what we do and you know what uh, some of the folks in this room are probably doing are that uh, all of our entire network is software planned, provisioned, and monitored and managed. So everything is run by software. I personally uh, dislike getting paged in the middle of the night and SSHing into various routers and servers. So this is very good for, for my own personal sleep health. Um, the entire network is also built on a graph topology, um, and so it looks like a big, I think someone described it earlier today as a big spider web, which is actually pretty close. Um, we set up a lot of redundant links in the network uh, using relatively cheap gear, like Ubiquiti stuff, which, as we all know, doesn't have the best uptime. Um, but with the backups in place, then the network is actually uh, made to run much more reliably. Um, we are also 100% layer 3 routed. And uh, we're using a classic SDN architecture, which means that all of the hardware uh, is being told what to do from a central authority. So we have a software router that runs in the cloud. It determines what, where all the traffic should go, and it tells all the nodes where to send that traffic. So all the nodes become packet forwarders and not necessarily uh, smart routers, if you will. Um, and uh, lastly, we're using cost-efficient unlicensed spectrum, uh, or lightly licensed, as it were. Uh, so 5 gig, 24, 60, and 70, 80. We kind of use it all because we're trying to provide customers with a pretty high-speed bandwidth. I think we generally today we advertise 75 megabit synchronous plans, um, you know, including customers that are getting service through 5 gig. Uh, but many of our customers are seeing. Uh, a couple hundred megabits plus. Uh, some are actually, on, some folks that are on the new 60 gigahertz gear are seeing almost gigabit speeds over wireless links. And uh, I guess I should have reversed these slides, but name, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of Common Networks, and my email address is available here and apparently also on the Groupio. So if you have any questions after this session, feel free to email me and I'm happy to uh, chat more. Okay, so I'm gonna cover a few topics here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, IPv6 DNS, which um, uh, Dennis actually already covered a bit. Uh, we're going to also talk about uh, RA, uh, which uh, router advertisement, um, which is part of getting Slack working, um, versus maybe, or I should say, in addition to DHCP v6. Um, I'll talk briefly about what we're doing with tunnels, and then lastly, I'll cover a technique that uh, called dual stack light, DS light, um, which is a way to um, get uh, V4 traffic flowing if you want to run a V6 only routed network uh, on, your, on your own internal network, but you still want to provide V4 connectivity. Okay, so uh, Dennis, I think, covered some of this, but you know, V6 DNS is, is nothing uh, super new, uh, nor is it that special. It, um, these days, I think almost all um, you know, sites that are publishing, that have IPv6 addresses, are publishing quad A records. They sit right alongside your standard single A records, and so um, all popular DNS servers and the entire recursive DNS system is already propagating quad A records alongside uh, single A records. Um, and so the records look uh, pretty much the same. Uh, they just have the host name and then they tell you which IP address to go to. The quad A just points to a larger 128-bit V6 address instead of the uh, standard 32-bit V4 address. So here's a quick example of Google. If you um, do like a you know, DNS dig query or something like that, you can ask for either an A record or a quad A record, and you see they look basically the same. They just have different addresses. And all that does is just tell your clients what IP address to try to connect to. Um, and also on the hosting side, you know, it's, uh, it's actually kind of the same thing. DNS is um, kind of a higher level protocol, so it doesn't really care what the underlying uh, uh, um, kind of IP 
protocol is. So you can, the same IP uh, host server, whether, you know, for example, bind or DNS mask, can be set to bind to a v4 or v6 address or both simultaneously usually, uh, and it can serve up the same, you know, this DNS protocol, um, regardless of if clients are connecting on v4 or v6. Um, and so there's some examples here of uh, publicly well-known v6 public DNS servers that are available, you know, they serve basically the same purpose. Uh, so you, you can kind of start letting customers use the v6 ones if you like. Um, you know, since v, uh, I guess the only real question here is why would we use v6 DNS server addresses? And, um, and the answer is it's for if you, ha if you want to one day move to a v6 only network. Uh, since v4 DNS servers can already serve v6 addresses alongside before you might think you might not need it, but uh, one day we might turn off v4 and you'll want those v6 DNS servers. Okay, so um, uh, uh, Dennis did talk about Slack, which is really great. Um, I think at this point it's quickly becoming the de facto standard for uh, IPv6 addressing for all like end consumer devices. Um, a uh, quick protocol overview for those who are interested. Um, you know, it's a uh, very, uh, a very straightforward protocol. Um, it's in the ICMP v6 spec. Um, the any client that shows up can send a quick uh, router solicitation packet to um, uh, to a special well-known address ff02 colon colon two. All the routers on that local segment will respond with a router advertisement, and you can also include some flags and options in there. And uh, kind of there's a set of conditions that need to be true for Slack to start working. Um, you need the the prefix that's given from the router advertisement to be big enough. Um, I think Dennis mentioned already, uh, at least a slash 64. Um, the proper flags need to be set there. So you need, I think, A, which is kind of auto, to one, uh, so that the clients know that they can engage Slack. And of course, the client has to support Slack, which, um, well, nowadays is pretty certain, but if you have customers that still have older devices on the network, then sometimes they won't actually support it, so it won't really matter. Um, and that's, so one of the other things that you usually get with DHCP is you also get your DNS server and all sorts of other options and goodies. And so um, you kind of have a few options if you're going to use router advertisement in Slack uh, in a v6 world. You can, for example, use just v4 DNS only. Uh, if you are running a dual stack system, then most clients will still have a v4 address. And so uh, they can still use their v4 DNS server as they were. Um, option two is there's a there's a uh, RDNSS option inside the RA spec, so they can add uh, an option to inform clients of where their DNS server should be, um, just like in DHCP. Um, however, there's an unfortunate part here where uh, not everybody supports this, I think. Um, some older clients may actually still require a specialized daemon to, to actually parse this message or option. Um, and lastly, there's DHCP v6, which uh, um, uh, the router advertisement message can also say that there's a DHCP server available, and uh, that means that you can get other information from it as well. Um, so uh, for us on our v6 network, we actually use both options two and three um, because, like, a, uh, like I was mentioning, some clients have issues supporting um, just one of the options, even though I think um, we prefer the router advertisement only option. Okay, and then uh, so a quick note on DHCP v6. Um, DHCP v6 is used basically just like DHCP for IPv4 address uh, for networks. Um, you, know, you can configure the range that you want um, clients to get from you know from your DHCP server, etc. And actually, it can be used in parallel, uh, which is what we do. Um, and so a quick note on what we do. Uh, actually, this is a part, I know somebody came up from Aaron earlier um, suggesting that we should give everybody slash 48 addresses, but I guess um, Dennis and I are on the same page here. We also do not give people slash 48 addresses. We give um, every customer home gets a slash 56. Uh, that allows us then to have enough space to do a prefix delegation to a slash 64 if they want to plug in their own router. Um, but for us, a lot of it was because uh, we need to assign addresses for our internal routing as well, and we want to have internal v6 uh, routing. Now, um, you know, uh, for us then, it's easier 
um, kind of to come up with an addressing scheme for all of our internal routers uh, in a particular space. And for us, we've chosen kind of the infix, if you will, between slash 40 and slash 56. That gives us 16 bits of space to assign um, our internal routers that will forward packets from hop to hop. Um, and you know that that's a, what you, we could actually use pretty much any space we want, um, but it's easiest for us as humans to parse and understand where the traffic is flowing if we kind of reserve a space and then give routers down the way like a bi you know, bigger piece of the pie. Um, and for us, we actually, for our internal routing um, and IP assignment, we do a completely custom system. Um, and that's because we want uh, the, since we have a custom router and custom routing protocol to manage our graph-based network, uh, you have to know the addresses of your routers when you're setting up your routes. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to figure out where the destinations, gateways, and next hops should be. Um, we did consider using DHCP and Slack on our own internal network, but we found that that would be difficult because you know, you'd have to kind of reverse out what IPv6 addresses were either assigned or self-assigned to all of your routers, and that's kind of a big pain. And so um, for this particular case for internal routing, we actually just uh, have our software assign everything um, straight up. Oops. Oh, and then a oh, quick note here. Um, our customer networks have both DHCP v6 and Slack running kind of side by side. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just, just a quick question. You said you did the 56 because it was easier to put it down there um, from 40 to 56. Why is that easier than from 32 to 48? 32 to 40. Oh, uh, <coughs> yes, I should have covered that. Um, uh, so uh, we have a slash 32 from Aaron, and we have multiple pops. So we uh, give each pop site um, a, space, a slash 40 space. And then so we're left with the slash 40, the slash 56 for all internal routing. But you could easily go back to Aaron and instead of a 32, get a, uh, what is that, uh, a 24. Um, it's actually, not hard. That's technically not allowed on the rules. Uh, your biggest first request is a slash 32. Your biggest first allowable request is a slash 32. That's not true. It's, I wrote the rules. I very much know what they are. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's neat. I should get You can get more. a 24, no problem. OK, cool. Can I have a 16? <laughs> <laughs> that depends on the number of pops you've got and the number of customers served by your largest pop. Um, but let's talk afterwards okay, because cool. I bet you can get more space than you think you can. Yeah, um, actually, we wouldn't mind that. You know, uh, For us, it's actually really easy to reassign everything because the software does it. So we'd love to use up more space. <laughs> um, does it cost more? Potentially. OK. <laughs> there's a fee. For those who have, uh, I think there's a, some, a set of IPv6 rules that, are, um, that the questioner is, is referencing that are posted on the Aaron website. There's also a fee schedule. So um, something yeah, to, to be aware To of. put it in perspective, every time you go up 16 times as much address space, generally your fee doubles. So it's actually cool. not a particularly bad deal. <laughs> Uh, no, I think we pay like a couple grand for annually for a slash 32, and then it, you know, like. Yeah, it, like it depends on how much V4 you've got also, because you pay the higher of your V4 utilization or your V6 utilization. Um, so. Yeah, that's, that's quite probable. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, Unless you're so, paying 1,000. <laughs> so if 1,000 gets you a 32, then 2,000 gets you a 28. If you wanted to go all the way to a 24, you'd probably end up paying 4,000. Oh, it's in increments of four bits? Okay. Oh. Well, four bits is 16 yeah, times the address right. space, right? And it doubles your price. OK. <laughs> Increases quickly then. OK. Um, Cool. Uh, lastly, we configure all of our networks, um, you know, generally using DNS mask, which is a nifty little tool that does a lot of things. Um, and so in addition to all the things that it can already do for you in your v4 space, like DNS cache and DHCP serving and well, a host of other things, um, it can also do uh, IPv6, DHCP v6, um, and also will actually do your router advertisement as well. So you don't need to set up a separate daemon. A popular one back in the day was um, uh, RADVD. Um, but you don't need that anymore if you have DNS, a modern version of DNS mask already. Uh, cool. Next topic, tunnels. Um, so on our network, some of our routes are, uh, some of our layer three routes are actually v6 only. And, but we still need to support v6 traffic. So we already engage 
uh, some tunnels to get the V4 traffic flowing through a, a V6 transport. Um, so there are a lot of different tunnel options available and you can kind of choose uh, kind of what level of tunneling you want. Um, for us, we use IP6 GRE TAP, which uh, basically simulates a uh, transparent layer two bridge. I say simulates and transparent mostly in quotes because there are a few, quite a few caveats and gotchas in there. Um, but uh, once you configure all the flags properly, uh, for example, enabling ARP and whatnot, you can get uh, a, an IP6 GRE tab to look exactly like as if you have two new network interfaces that just happen to be virtually tunneled uh, over IPv6 only. Um, now this, there's a little warning here too, which I was um, kind of talking about with the uh, previous question that was asked around MTU. Um, one of the issues with uh, starting to use a lot of IPv6 tunnels is um, you should take a look at whether your path MTU discovery is working properly. Uh, oftentimes, the, uh, the interface, which, um, which is now kind of a virtual tunnel interface, might advertise a particular MTU, but internally it might get squished because it's adding additional tunnel overhead now in addition to V6 headers and, and whatnot. So that actually makes your effective payload MTU much smaller. Um, oftentimes, apps are pretty, application layer protocols are decent at, at handling this now. Um, however, we did see some issues with uh, certain TLS stacks that really demanded uh, full path MTU discovery work properly. Um, otherwise, a TLS session could not be established. So um, something to watch out for and uh, something that we've heard other folks have run into as well. Yeah, so um, the question was, uh, what were some of the issues around MTU size when using IP6 tunnels? Um, and the answer that we ran into was, uh, so um, when establishing the TLS connection, some TLS servers uh, send back kind of their initial connection ACK packets with a certain size, and if that packet runs into a place, you know, where the, the packet size is larger than the MTU available, then the packet maybe get dropped. Um, and in our case, with an IP6 GRE tap, um, it was being silently dropped. It would basically show up to the IP6 GRE portion of the tunnel and just die. And so the other side, the client would never get the ini uh, initial connection ACK um, so what we found was the, uh, with an IP6 GRE tap, the usable MTU was something in the like 1410, 1420 size, which is much smaller than most application servers are expecting. They're expecting to be able to use, I think, at least 1460 or so, because they kind of figure. Yeah, so, right, so uh, the caller, oh, sorry, not caller. <laughs> the, que the, uh, the, first, the question is, so we should increase the MT size, and that, I think that is a strategy that you can use, yes. Um, so you can kind of pick one or the other. Um, one strategy is you can tell the, uh, uh, the client side port that, the, um, that your MTU is decreased, so instead of leaving it at 1500 by default, you can try to decrease it and hope that the, um, the client devices will actually send up the information, the support information. Yeah, so my understanding, um, and I'm, you know, it's based on different TLS implementations, so this could be busted, um, is that the, the sender can also send their, PM, uh, their MTU size or supported size uh, as part of the protocol as the connection is being established and the server won't try to exceed that. Um, well, so the other option is instead of hoping that the client does the right thing when trying to establish a connection that the server does the right thing as well, what you can do is increase the MTU sizes in the middle. So as long as all of your equipment supports larger frame sizes, then you should be good. Yeah. Uh, no, you do it I guess the outside. answer is all the layers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need it on your so, switches, you need it on your, if you're using radios, the radios need to support these larger packets. So um, I, I, either I am confused or what you're doing here is talking about working around a bug. Um, because whatever's doing that GRE encapsulation, when it gets a 1500 octet packet or a yes. packet larger than it can stuff into the tunnel, it should be seeing either a DF bit or no DF bit 
If it sees no DF bit, it should be fragmenting that packet. And if it sees a DF bit, it should be sending back an ICMP unreachable packet too big with information about how big a packet it can handle. Yes, I agree with you. So uh, I don't know whose hardware you're using to do the, the GRE tap encapsulation, um, but whoever it is, you should beat them about the head and shoulders until they fix that bug. That's a much better solution to all of this than trying to change MTUs on CPE or trying to implement jumbo frames everywhere so that you can run small frames inside them, inside tunnels, or any of the other workarounds that have been discussed here. Yes, that's a, that's a great idea. However, um, we've already deployed all these things, so we're stuck. <laughs> you can't upgrade the software? What's that? You can't upgrade the software? Uh, I can, but that's a large operation for us. Um, so the, the, the particular tunnel um, infrastructure we're using is the Linux kernel. Um, so Linux kernel 4.10 through 4.16. Um, you know, for us, uh, doing a kernel upgrade on all of our devices is Definitely doable, uh, but a decent amount of work. And so um, in the meantime, uh, we've changed the M2 settings. <laughs> oh, no, the, the feature is supported in, the, the feature is available, uh, but there are, let's see, maybe I should have, maybe I should have labeled this as <coughs> quote unquote issues <laughs> or bugs as the uh, previous. Oh, yeah. Um, so we're past 4.9. So, I mean, we're experiencing this uh, in 4.10 and 4.14. That's right. Okay. Yes. No. Uh, okay. That's correct. Yes. Uh, this, so the, um, the, the, the questioner is asking if we're using specific equipment or, um, you know, or what, uh, what flavor of uh, kernel and version are we using? And, and the answer is we're using um, generic uh, head, head built kernel um, and uh, we're using our own routers. Uh, cool, last, question, last little bit here, um, and please feel free to jump in with other questions, uh, is DS Lite. Um, and so DS Lite is, is something that we are looking to move to. Right now we're in a transition state where we've dual stacked um, the entire stack. So all the way from our pops through the internal routing um, down to the customers and then all the customer devices are getting V4 and V6 addresses side by side. Um, and so V4 traffic runs on the V4 stack all the way out, and then V6 traffic runs in parallel uh, through that entire stack. We are looking to move our internal network to V6, which is um, nice for many reasons. Uh, if nothing else, it means that we only have one stack to manage internally. Um, we still have to serve, of course, customers V4 and V6. As Dennis was saying, you're going to find that customer or that particular website that doesn't have V6 set up for some reason or other. Or if your upstream provider is somebody like um, Cogent, then you might not be able to hit Google. So that's uh, also another problem. Um, but uh, you know, so V4 will be there for a while, and so for us, we're, using, we're gonna look at using DS Lite. Uh, DS Lite is basically if you have full control of your router then, um, you have the router do uh, NAT and uh, Android translation then for your customer network. And then from there, it encapsulates all that V4 traffic into a V6 tunnel and then moves to your POP. And at your POP, you kind of unpack that and then use something like a carrier grade NAT to push that out to the internet. So, you know, basically um, it's a, for the most st standard setup would be a dual NAT setup with a tunnel in between. Um, there is also a new proposal to do um, uh, another uh, even lighter version of DS Lite where they actually push the V4 address um, to the CPE and then assign SNAT port ranges to each CPE. So basically all the CPEs across your network will use the same V4 addresses, just different portions of the port range to do their NAT. And then that way you can kind of escape some of the carrier grade NAT setup at your pop. It just depends on how many V4 addresses you have, how complicated you think that's gonna be versus just setting up a single NAT that you manage at your pop. Um, but uh, oh, yes, did, did you have some comments? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, the comments were that all of these things are ugly, and uh, I think all of us would heartily agree. Uh, and hopefully, in about 10 years, maybe, optimistically, maybe. we'll be deleting all of this, and everybody will be V6 all the time. <laughs> um, Wouldn't that be nice? 
Yeah. Yep. That's the end of my presentation. If you have questions, uh, yes. Let's see. The question was: Is there an equivalent of a simple what? Sorry. Proxy ARP. No. Proxy ARP. Not oh, that I know. Of. Not not that. And we I know. wouldn't recommend using so, proxy ARP anyway. So so uh, I'll I'll actually address that because I have some knowledge. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I've I've done a little bit of E6 work in the in the real world. Um, I'm Owen DeLong. I'm with the Aaron Advisory Council. I'm also with Sail Internet. Um, and my previous job, I was an IPv6 evangelist at Hurricane Electric. Um, so, and the network architect at Akamai as well. So, um, there is no proxy ARP in IPv6 in part because there is no ARP in IPv6. Um, there's really no practical purpose for proxy neighbor discovery in v6. Um, they they kind of cleaned up all of the things that were the mess that required proxy ARP in IPv4, and you, you kind of have this clean, this is a layer three link, this is not a layer three link uh, boundary in the v6 world. And if you're feeling the need to do something that requires proxy ARP in IPv6, you probably should be rethinking what you're trying to do. It's probably just not a good idea. Um, so there are lots of things in v6 that try and prevent us bringing forward some of the truly hideous things that we did to work around v4 shortcomings, because in general, v6 lacks those shortcomings. Yes, I would second that. You should probably move to L3 routing. Yeah, I, I would not use, I try to eliminate proxy ARP on everything I can find. <laughs> so, question. Why didn't we go with enhanced IPX 25 years ago? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose they had enough addresses. Anyway, um, so what, has anybody finally started going with some carrier grade NAT that we can all afford or? Um, I, I see. The question was, um, is there a carrier grade NAT that we can all afford? Yeah. Well, um, Microtech does it. In plenty of open source carrier grade NAT. Yeah. The issue is linking it to your CRM system so you can track it back. Right. I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen any that looks like Microtech right. does carrier grade NAT too. Um, Microtech does? Yeah. Last time I looked, it didn't, but yeah, it you does. know it better than I do. It does. Why, why would you want it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the, the, the bigger question is, why do you want it? Well, yeah, because right now I have... I, yeah. I, I, there's no reason for it. Um, I don't know a reason for it other than well, my ISP if you wish to track stuff. So that's why. Yeah, so well, I, I understand that, but why do you need carrier-grade NAT? What, because the, I've got NATs on every single router. What's wrong with that? Because then I can't access other parts of my network from my accounting system or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You you would get you would get a slash twenty four if you had a v six uh, block. Um, let's see. The the question was around carry grade NAT, yeah. right? And uh, if there's a cheap solution available, um, we've we've been using the Linux kernel <laughs> for carry grade NAT. Our our pop sites run. Um, like open compute platform one u servers and um, other relatively plentiful available x86 machines that are all these days pretty cheap. So you know, for less than a thousand bucks, you can get hexacore Xeons with hyper threading, eight to sixteen gigs RAM, install Linux on them, and the problem is you're going to have to do a little bit of homework uh, to figure out how to configure all those options. Um, but IP tables, IP6 tables, all the you know packet forwarding stuff, uh, IP6 forwarding, IPv4 forwarding stuff all works right out of the box uh, with any modern Linux install. Um, and then uh, in terms of the NAT stuff, um, you know the uh, IP table. So you probably want to look at IP tables SNAT, which is very performant. You'll have to do some net filter contract tuning. Um, which means you have to increase the number of entries that are in the contract table and all these different little parameters depending on how large your network is and, and how many clients you're going to be serving behind it. Um, but you know we've been we've had very good success with uh, with using Linux straight up, and it's free. <laughs> People think. Think of CGNAT and they think of 100.70 address space. Okay, 
Oh, I'm sorry, it, it's a range, but yeah. 164. So 100 dot whatever. Um, what that really is is a new set of private address space that probably isn't going to be assigned on the back side of a customer router, which makes it useful for the front side of the stuff in the network mm -hmm. and public, semi-public facing addresses. The challenge for what truly is carrier grade NAT is that you've got to be able to track that address back to a specific customer at a specific point in time. So the NAT isn't the problem, it's the tie back to your authentication system in your CRM system if you get a subpoena. That's really what the carrier grade NAT stuff is about. It's more database than NAT. So my only response to that is who says you have to track it? Kalia, <laughs> uh, yeah, the yeah, communications assistance philosophy I, I, under, I understand. says you have to track it back. Right now you can say I'm sorry there's 10 customers on there I can't help you anymore. Right, right. No, that's if you get a live yeah, tap request, a live tap. but if they come and say, we've got this IP address and port number that was used to access this address and port number at this time, what customer was that? You are actually required to be able to tell them what customer that was. I have never seen that. It's, it's, it's in the Kalia. But it is, it is the law. Gotcha. I have never seen that, and I, we did a Kalia session last year, and we had three lawyers in the room, they did not say we had to. Yeah, live taps are extraordinarily rare. I used to run a large VoIP network with um, 980,000 phone numbers and was the largest inbound VoIP service on the internet at one point. I got between six and 10 uh, law enforcement subpoenas per week. I dealt with agencies all over the country, everything up to and including national security letters. I never got a live tap request. I got yeah. a lot of clueless law enforcement wanting to figure out how to find a bad guy oh, yeah, that they would yeah, never yeah. get. <laughs> right, I right. never got a live tap request. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Any other questions? We are definitely out of time. Uh, the exhibit hall is open. Any? Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.